All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So wonderful to see you all out on this very frigid morning, but hopefully warmer days are ahead. But we're glad that you're here this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful to God that we have this opportunity to come together to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, Steve's here with us this morning. Caroline's with us this morning. So we've got a couple of people who aren't normally here with us Sunday morning. So we're thankful that you all are here. Um, we do have some updates on our uh, sick list. And as always, if there's something else I need to know, let me know. And we'll try to make sure that we announce it tonight. Uh, Gus Buckner, this is Leona's cousin. We've had him on the continued prayer list for quite some time. He has, uh, he has cancer. He has finished his treatments and seems to be doing well. Uh, that's where he's at, but they don't know if he's in remission or anything yet, do they? But <coughs> seems to be doing well, so at least he's, he's through with his treatments. Uh, Carlene Brown, I've uh, been praying for her as well, Maurice's first cousin's wife. She's doing very well. Her cancer is in remission, and so uh, she seems to be in excellent condition. So we're thankful for those uh, prayers that were answered in that way. Uh, it's good to see Sister Jacqueline here walking today. Didn't even need the wheelchair. And so, as I told some of y'all a while ago, we kind of have some good news and some bad news with Jacqueline, but hopefully the good news is more permanent. And the bad news is just kind of another little setback, but hopefully temporary. So, you know, she had that surgery and they, they put the, this box in her back and apparently it attaches on both sides of the spine. And so one, the bad news is one of those has come loose. And so they have to wait about five or six weeks and then she's gonna have to, they're gonna have to do it again. She's gonna have to have surgery again. So that is still hurting really bad because obviously it's disconnected and it's not working. The good news is the other side that's connected, it's working. And so that's why she's able to walk this morning because at least she's in a lot less pain. She's still in pain, but less. So there's hope there that, well, if they can connect that thing and it'll stay, that she's gonna get some significant relief. And so we're, we're so thankful for that. But uh, unfortunate that she's gotta go through it again. But uh, there's, there's hope there that if they get that thing attached right, that it'll, it'll really help with her, her pain issues. And so we're thankful for that. So keep praying for her. And in the condition she's in, she made food for everybody. So there is a spaghetti, right, and garlic bread downstairs. So I put it downstairs in the fridge. So you all please, when service is over, make sure you go, we got plates and stuff, go and get you some. If you need to go and take it home, whatever. I didn't know she was bringing any. You had no business doing that, the condition you were in, but, but that's how much she loves this congregation. And so she wanted to do that. And so on behalf of everybody, Jacqueline, thank you for doing that so y'all make sure don't hurt her feelings and not take some food y'all go down there and get some food whenever whenever the preacher shuts up okay all right uh, Bobby uh, his daughter came by yesterday uh, he has pleurisy he's got fluid uh, around the heart and stuff and so he is they've given him some medication for that and she feels like that he's getting a little better but he's still very very weak uh, and so they were afraid for him to get out today, which I told her, so well, I don't blame you. That's, you know, he probably doesn't need to get out in all this cold. And he did, uh, when they took him in though, said he did test negative for the flu and he tested negative for COVID. Uh, so he doesn't have that, but he's probably got that, you know, that other congestive stuff that's going along. But uh, she said he, he get a little bit better each day. So thankful for that. Uh, Marty Hammonds has the nerve issue in his neck. He has a doctor's appointment scheduled for January the 31st, and they're trying to figure out some way to fix that without having surgery. So let's pray that they can figure something out on that. Uh, I told y'all Wednesday night, Keisha, I think I told you, Keisha fell down the stairs. Um, the other day she had gone to get groceries and there was an ice patch. She didn't see it, she hit it, and she went all the way down the stairs. And so she's in a lot of pain from that. She doesn't think she broke anything, but she, that's why she, she told me she was gonna to try to come this morning, but maybe she'll be here tonight. Pray for her. Uh, Cheryl did not get to have the surgery last week because of the weather, but they rescheduled it for uh, tomorrow, early tomorrow morning. So let's pray for him that that surgery is successful and 
helps him with his uh, issues. Uh, and then Rosie Buckner, this is Leona's sister. They took her to the emergency room last night with all that congestive respiratory stuff. And they've given her uh, some medicine for that. So hopefully that medicine will help her to get better, but she's, she's not feeling good at all. She's really struggling with that. So please uh, pray for her. Uh, and Charlie and Joanne aren't here. Cheryl tells me they, they still can't get off the mountain. So that's, which I have no doubt. So, uh, Elaine said they didn't want to ice skate down the mountain, so I don't blame them. So they're, they're not here, this, but that's why they're not here this morning. So, um, in other announcements, again, there'll be a marriage seminar February 14th through 18th up in Sevierville. The information's in the back on that. Uh, Sweetwater will be holding the area wide singing. This will be next Sunday, January 28th. That'll be at 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. So, if you can support that, please do so. All right, that's all I have. We're going to turn the song service over to uh, Brother Cheryl. And at the appropriate time, Brother Maurice has our opening prayer, and then Brother Ralph will have our dismissal prayer. We have some more visitors. Thank you. Welcome, folks. Thank you for coming. Brother Cheryl. Morning, everyone. I get through, through this. Please get your song book and turn to number 249. Somewhere listening for my name. 
I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white, when it calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. If my robe is white, when it calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Please turn your song books to number 105. Let's sign this for power for the Lord's Supper. Gently whispers, do this. 
doubt that most people here use an iPhone or somewhere for communications and it's probably considered part of their body almost. And also many young people and other people use earbuds that connect themselves to the phone. And um, if you use earbuds, you'll find that you might get away from the phone and it will say disconnected. Or you get near the phone, it'll say connected. And that's to show you that Bluetooth, they call it, is working. Well, can you imagine how it is with Jesus and God, how he feels when we're connected or not connected? If we could have that feeling inside of ourselves that we are not connected and keep connected, for the Lord's Supper today, I'm going to read Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning the 22nd verse. And my point is, we're connected through the blood. Mark, 14th chapter, beginning in verse 22. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. But let's pray. Father God, we come to your throne asking you to bless this fruit of this bread when we take this bread we break it and we think about the broken body of your son upon the cross we ask you to keep that in mind uh, for us to keep that in mind as we partake of this bread in Jesus name we pray amen To us it represents the blood that your son shed upon the cross. We thank you for that blood that we can have hope of salvation if we follow his commandments. And we know that at one time we were connected to that blood through baptism and we pray that we continue to be connected. We thank you for that fruit this fruit of the vine that we're about to take and help us to remember the sacrifice of your son upon the cross. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. I'm going to read the second Corinthians the ninth chapter of verse 7. Every man according to the purpose in his heart so let him give, not grudgingly or a necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Father God, we come to your throne. Thanking you for the many blessings that you've given us. We realize that everything comes from you. Every breath. Thank you for the material blessings of this life. Help us to share those material blessings with others. Help us to realize that we can help others if we would, if we will, would be willing to do that. Help us to have that ability to do that. Help us to challenge our hearts to, to, to help others. In Jesus' name we pray.
Please get your song book and turn to number 316. Let's sign this before the lesson. <coughs> What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Bleeding, bleeding, safe and secure from all alarms. Bleeding. If you would please be turning in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. We're going to be looking in chapter 4 here in just a few seconds. Cheryl, what was that song imitation? 687. 687. We are told, as we'll see in just a moment, that Satan is the God, little g, the God of this world. What does that mean? Well, that means that Satan does have some power. He has some power here on earth. Well, how much power exactly does he have? Well, we want to notice that it's not complete power, okay? Satan is not omnipotent. God is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. God has the power to do anything he wants. But Satan is not omnipotent. He can't do anything, but he does have some powers here. Now, a good illustration of this, of his limitation, is you think about in the book of Job. If we were to go back and look at Job, you know, the first chapter or two in Job, you see this account where the, the sons of God, the angels, they come there to meet with God, and, and Satan's there. And so God asks Satan, well, what about my servant Job? He's righteous, he's faithful, he's, you know, he does what I ask him to do. Satan, of course, says, well, that's only because you've put a wall around him. You protect him. You've given him everything. Of course he loves you. But if things went bad for him, if you'd let me get a hold of him for a little bit, he'd curse your face. So God says, okay. Says, I will allow you to do some damage to him. And we see what happens with his family and his wealth and those kind of things. And, but that still didn't turn Job. So Satan comes back and says, well, it's, it's because 
his physical body, you know, he's still, he's in great health. If he were to be afflicted, then he'd turn from you. So God says, all right, well, you can afflict him, but you cannot kill him. And so Satan does, and we know how that goes out. Job stays, and Job has some questions, but he, he does not curse God. But the, the illustration that we see in this story is that Satan doesn't have complete power. He can't do whatever he wants. He couldn't touch Job unless God allowed it, right? He couldn't touch his property or his family or his physical body unless God allowed him to do it. And God would not allow him to kill Job. So Satan didn't have the power to kill Job. God certainly could, but Satan does not. So that illustrates to us that he's got some power here, but he doesn't have <coughs> complete power. So a key idea I want us to look at this morning and tonight as we, we examine this topic, Blinded by Satan, I want us to think about this or realize this. Satan does not have the power to coerce. He does not. Okay, a lot of us, maybe we would like to blame him. If I commit a sin, well, you know, I just... I, I, the devil put that temptation in front of me and I, I couldn't do it so it's all his fault. I, I couldn't resist it. It's his fault. Wrong. My fault. Because Satan cannot force me to sin against God. He cannot. He doesn't have the power to do that. It's ultimately my choice. So pay, Satan does not have the power to coerce but he does have the power to deceive. He does have the power to tempt us, to trick us to lie to us, to, to try to get us to believe falsehoods, to get us to do things that he would rather us do and God doesn't want us to do. So Satan does have power to do that. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 4. Let's begin reading in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom, notice, little g, the God of this world, talking about Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Christ gives the light. Satan is darkness. So through his deception, through his ability to blind us, he can lead us into darkness, but only if we allow him to do so. He can't force me to go there. But he does have some power to try to tempt me to go into the darkness. We see here, though, that God is the light who can bring us out of the darkness, and that's the way that we must go. We need to be wary of the traps that Satan will lay for us, but always keep that in your mind, that he can't make you do anything against your will. So if we sin against God, it's nobody's fault but ourselves. We need to look in the mirror and not fall for these deceptions of Satan. So the devil has been very successful in blinding a lot of people from the truth, the truth that we've talked about often. He has blinded them from the truth because the truth is what will allow them to be saved. And of course, Satan, he's lost. He wants all the rest of us to be lost. Misery loves company, as they say. What else has he got going for him? So he's led a lot of people away from the truth. So this morning and tonight, we want to look at a few examples of how Satan has blinded people. It's really what we want to focus on this morning. And then tonight, we want to look at, Lord willing, some ways that Satan can come after you and me, ways that he can tempt us away from God and into the darkness. So this morning, let's look at three or four examples of blinding just there's a lot of examples a lot of things that we could pick out but I've 
picked out just a few things that we will get the idea with of ways that Satan has blinded people from the truth. So first of all, let's consider those who are atheists. Satan has blinded these people who, but, but notice what I say here, blinded the people that have chosen not to believe in God. Satan couldn't force them not to believe in God, but they've made that choice that they don't want to believe in God, and so Satan has blinded them to the truth, to even an examination of the truth. It is their choice, but they've allowed Satan to deceive them into believing a lie rather than what is true. So turn in your Bibles to Psalm 14. Psalm 14. Let's we'll see what God has to say about this again as we look to the light. So they have believed the deception of Satan, that there is no God. Psalm 14 and 1, notice how God says this, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. We've talked about that word abominable or abomination. That is something that God finds disgusting, repulsive, makes him sick in a, in a term that we can understand. The fool has said there is no God. Now we spent a year and a half or more on Wednesday nights here in our congregation studying in our Wednesday night Bible study the evidences for God. And we spent, I guess, at least a year and a half on that. We probably could have spent another year and a half or more going over all the other evidence that we didn't cover because I just didn't want to bore you to death. But it, it's overwhelming. The evidence for God's existence is completely overwhelming to any open, honest mind. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> And yet these people refuse to see it. They've been blinded to the truth. They have so convinced themselves to put their faith in the science of men, to put their belief in evolution, which we also looked at in that study and saw there's an overwhelming amount of evidence for God. There's virtually no evidence for evolution. So they just manufacture it. They create it because they're so deluded that that's what they, they determined. Now, I'm going to believe evolution. I'm not going to believe in God. God calls that foolishness. Satan has deluded them into digging in and believing this lie that there is no God. Well, let's look at a second one. What about sexual immorality? Now, we've talked about this in several sermons recently, but we know that this is rampant in our society today. But to be honest, it's probably always been that way. If you, again, y'all know I'm a history nerd, so if you read through history, it's not really anything new. Mankind has always been inundated with these type of things, but maybe what is new to our time period that's unique to us that has never been before is we understand that the, the deviants, the perverts, the, the people that engage in this kind of behavior, they simply today, they have a much bigger platform than any people have ever had in the past because of our technology, because of the internet, because of social media. And I want to make sure that we understand Technology in and of itself, there's nothing evil about it. It's, it's a tool like anything else. That same technology also takes the gospel to billions of people every year. Now, whether they believe it or not, it's up to them. But it's a tool we can use to take the gospel to people. So it's a tool. You can use it for good or for evil. But that expanded reach has allowed more people than ever to be inundated with these types of ideas where before it was much harder to do that. I remember back when, you know, again, when I was a school teacher, and I guess this was around the turn of the century, kind of seems funny to say that. But can't believe 
believe that's already 24 years ago. It's what happened. But anyway, it's probably right around there somewhere. We were having a teacher in service, and, and back then, we, of course, we had computer labs. Before this, was, nobody had a cell phone back then. They, they were about to come out, but we had the computer labs, and sometimes you take your kids. And so they were talking to us in the computer lab about you got to worry about that the kids can get on the computer and they can access pornography. And this is before somebody came out with filters and schools can buy filters and, you know. And I remember, I was like, what? And y'all know me, I don't know, I'm technologically challenged. I still am, I was even worse back then. So I could not believe that, I had no idea. I said, you mean anybody can access? Well, yeah, it's easy. And I knew growing up, growing up, you know, that, that stuff, the adults seemed to understand, yeah, we want to keep that out of the hands of children. That stuff was really hard to get your hands on, but not anymore. So you mean 10-year-olds can get on here and see it? Well, yeah. So it, it's the platform that they have that they can expose so many more people to it that maybe wasn't available before all this modern technology came out. But God has warned us against this the problem is that Satan has convinced so many people and it seems maybe because of this technology it seems in our time period it's just snowballing and it's getting worse and worse that Satan has deluded people to believe that all this kind of behavior is perfectly fine it's normal it's acceptable don't worry about it if it feels good do it seems to be the attitude that a lot of people have problem is that's not God's attitude and it's not the way he wants us to look at this so look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 the Bible says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God do you not understand that if you're unrighteous you will not go to heaven be not deceived right said so Satan has the power to deceive God is saying, don't let him do that to you. The ultimate choice is yours, but you're going to make bad choices if you allow him to deceive. If you fall for the lies that, oh, all these kinds of behaviors, oh, they're fine, it's okay. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves or mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners. Say none of those people shall inherit the kingdom of God. Not unless you repent. But say if you continue in that lifestyle and you die in that lifestyle, you will die lost. That's guaranteed. So we notice here among these things, we have several things listed here that fall under this, this umbrella of sexual immorality. So let's consider, for example, this idea of fornication. Fornication includes all kinds of things. So that would include adultery, which is also listed here. That would include homosexuality. That would include bestiality. That would include pedophilia, and so on and so forth. We can list other things. It includes a wide range of behaviors that God has said, people that do such things, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven because God is displeased and those things are bad for us we're told by the world that oh these things are fun and great and good for us but God is telling you need to stay away from those things they will lead you down that path to darkness and destruction and you need to stay away from those things these things have become at least some of them have become widely accepted right Adultery is not frowned on nearly as much in our society as it used to be. Obviously, homosexuality is not. Those things have become mainstream, perfectly all right to do that. And then a couple other that we mentioned, bestiality and pedophilia. Well, don't worry, those things will never become normalized. That's what they said about the other ones. There are people working on it right now. College professors, don't take my word for it. You can find the videos. College professors, PhDs, teaching our children. Nothing wrong with pedophilia. Somebody my age being with a five-year-old, what's wrong with that? What do you mean, what's wrong with that? 
They're seriously asking the question. They don't think anything's wrong with that. You should, you know, do whatever you want to do. Shouldn't matter. God said it matters. And, and to me, common sense ought to tell us it matters. But they want to normalize those things too. So don't say, well, that, that would never happen. That's what people said about those other things as well. And it did. It, it took a little while. But we've seen people in this country and other parts of the world moving us in that direction. Let's make it more normalized, more acceptable. Let's get these. These are people that have no shame. They're not ashamed because they don't think there's anything wrong with it. And they are trying to convince our young people that that's the truth. One of the ways they do it is by changing the language. So, for instance, pedophilia, right? So pedophilia, yeah, we understand. Well, that, that's a horrible, or at least we used to understand. That was a horrible thing. Everybody agreed. Well, not anymore. Some people, well, it's not so bad. So they decided, well, let's change the name. Because pedophilia, that has a negative connotation. Yeah, no kidding. Because we all know what it means. Well, let's not call those people pedophiles anymore. Let's call them minor attractive persons. If you don't believe me, like I said, look it up. Don't take my word for it. That's the new term for pedophiles. Minor attractive persons. Doesn't that sound so much better? Makes it go down smoother. Was a spoonful of sugar? what they're doing. God has told us, do not fall for these lies, for these deceptions of Satan. Satan will try to convince us that all these things are normal and perfectly fine. Why shouldn't we engage in those activities? That's all a lie. We need to follow what 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says. Those things will lead us straight to hell. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to heaven. So we don't need to follow those lies of Satan. Well, let's look at another one. What about abortion? This has been in the news a lot the last year or so, especially. Satan has blinded so many women, and men too, to the atrocity, and that's what it is, the atrocity of murdering their <coughs> own children. That, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a lifestyle choice. As we see here, I don't know how well y'all can see that, but you know, there was a, a protest the other day, which was that was on the good side a couple of days ago, the pro-life people protesting against abortion. They were out, God bless them. But you'll have the, the pro-abortion people, they're out there too, screaming and yelling, and they don't even mind using violence to promote their right. I have a right to murder your child. No, I have a right to abortion. Well, that's what it is. No, no, we don't want to call it that. You have a right to murder your child. They will fight for that right. And they're, they're already saying, oh, this is going to be a big issue in the presidential election. Are you going to allow? So again, we change the, the terminology, right? So abortion, yeah, that sounds better than murdering children. We don't talk about that. And now they use, they, they decided, well, yeah, abortion's kind of, everybody knows what that is, so we need to, again, we need to deceive people. So let's not use the word abortion anymore. Let's call it, you know, reproductive health care. That sounds better, doesn't it? Well, who could be against reproductive health care? But that's code for, let's murder our unborn children. That's what it means. But it sounds better. Well, why do you have to change the term novice? Is that great? We'll see, they know. But so many people have been deluded, and they will make this ridiculous claim, well, what's growing inside of the woman? It's not really a person. What is it, a giraffe? It's not really human. Was well, she going to have puppies? I mean, what do you... And ironically, the strange thing is that these very people that are pro-abortion, they would get mad if you killed a puppy. And I would too. Right, Joy? I would too. I don't want you to kill a puppy. But they'd be more mad about that than killing a human child. Well, that's okay. It's inconvenient right now to have a child. Well, maybe you should have thought about that. 
or you made those decisions that, that led to that. But they will say, yeah, it's not a person. Well, I wonder if God talks about this. I'm sure he does. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. God tells us this, and again, I say common sense ought to tell us this. We really don't need, well, I don't have a degree in science. I don't need one to know this is a child. <clears throat> and even our court system. So if you kill a, a woman who's, who's pregnant with a child, you will be charged with two murders. But if that woman wants to abort the child, oh no, that's not murder. It's like, somebody explain that to me. It makes no sense. It's illogical. It's irrational. It's unscientific. I don't need a degree to understand that. But look at what God said. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb... I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. God is telling us he knew me. He's always known me long before I was ever conceived, let alone born. God considered me a person, and every one of you, you were always a precious soul in his sight, always. Not after we come out the birth canal. Always. He said he plainly, before you came out of the womb, of course you were a person. You're not a glob of tissue. You're a human being. That's what God considers a baby growing in the womb. It's a human being. And again, common sense ought to tell us. So what is abortion? Abortion then is clearly the murder of a human being. An innocent human being. Tell me. I would love for them to tell me. What crime has this child committed that you are executing him for? Did he rob a bank? What, what did he do that he deserves the death penalty, he or she? You are condemning to death a child who is completely innocent. Yeah, they might grow up to be a serial killer, but you don't know that. Right now, they've done nothing. And God has something to say about that as well. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. God condemns murdering persons. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17. These six things doth the Lord hate. Strong word, hate. Yea, seven are an abomination. Again, it disgusts him. It reviles him. An abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and notice this one. And hands that shed innocent blood. You can't be any more innocent than an unborn child. You and I are not innocent. But an unborn child is. And abortion is a very bloody process. But God plainly says here, he hates hands that shed innocent blood. Whoever's involved in it, the mother, the doctor, anybody that's involved in this, God calls them an abomination. That is not his way of saying it's okay. But Satan has helped convince these people that this is not murder and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a choice that somebody can make. It's funny they're pro-choice on that, but they're not pro-choice on a lot of other things. But they are on that. It is not my choice righteously to kill another human being. If I'm defending myself, that's, but you know, if I just go kill somebody in cold blood, hey, my choice. No, we all know I'm going to go to prison. And if I don't repent of that, God will condemn me for it. We all understand that. Well, this is killing, shedding innocent blood. Well, finally this morning, let's look at one more. What about this idea of being good? Satan has blinded so many people. This maybe catches more than any. Into thinking that, you know, if you're generally a good person, well, then that's good enough to get to heaven. I'd say that's probably what most of the world believes. That's good enough to get to heaven. I mean, these people, you know, we know all these people. 
they, they pay their taxes, they obey all the laws, you know, they, they're not lawbreakers, they don't rob banks, they don't kill people, they don't commit any overtly evil acts, help their neighbor change a flat tire, you know, just, he's just a good old boy. But he's also a person who doesn't really care anything about God, maybe an atheist, maybe a believer in God, but doesn't really dedicate himself to God, never comes to church, doesn't really read the Bible, doesn't follow the things the Bible says. Oh, but he's a good person. We all know people like that. And generally speaking, by human terms, they are good people. But what does God say about this? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. These are people that don't worship God. They don't obey God. Is that good enough to get to heaven? It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what God said. So let's get his opinion. Let's ask God. Is that good enough, God? Does that matter? Even though they don't worship you, they don't obey you, but hey, they're generally good people. Is that, that'll get them in, right? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Notice that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Clearly says, those people that know not God, they don't get it. That doesn't mean literally, oh, I've never heard of God. It means I don't live my life for God. I don't really dedicate myself to him. It says here, those that do not obey the gospel, those people that will not be baptized, they will not follow the commands of God. It says they will be punished, everlasting torment. They may be good by human standards, but that's not good enough for God. And we've often said, does God expect us to be perfect? No, because none of us are, none of us ever will be. But God does expect us to dedicate ourselves to him and strive our best every day to try to live as righteously as we can. And then if we do sin and we do make a mistake, we repent and we correct that. That's not who God's talking about here. He's talking about those people that just, they don't really care about God. They might be good otherwise, but they just don't. Well, that's one of those lies of Satan that, well, you'll be fine. You'll, you don't have to go to church. It's okay. You don't have to read the Bible. You don't really have to pray to God. It's a, just live a pretty good life and God will let you in. That's a lie of the devil. This is why we need to be reminded. We'll close out with this this morning. John 8 and verse 12. We need to be reminded that Jesus is the light, not Satan. And we need to follow Christ so that we don't be deceived into walking into darkness. Don't let the world, who's operating, <laughs> Satan's operating through them, don't let them convince us of all these falsehoods that we talked about. John 8 and 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay, if we're following Christ, we cannot walk in darkness. But if we're believing the lies of Satan, that's exactly what we're doing. We are blind and deceived, and we're walking in the darkness. We have to go to the light. This evening, Lord willing, we want to continue this lesson. We want to look at what are some things that Satan can use. We want to look at three things specifically tonight. What are some tools, if you will, in his toolbox that he can use to deceive you and me, to pull us away from the light and convince us through lies that it's okay to walk in the darkness? Lord willing, we'll look at those things tonight at 6 o'clock. So we just saw in 2 Thessalonians where God said that those who do not obey the gospel will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not go to heaven. So this morning we ask you the question, have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? God has given us the blueprint, the path to do this, and there's only one way to go, and that's his way. And if I tell you any different way than what God told you, 
then I'm deceiving you. You don't need to listen to me. Well, he's a preacher. Who cares? I can lie. I can make a mistake. You need to listen to what God said. And God said this. We are to hear the word. We are to believe the word. We are to repent of our sins. Again, that's a complete change of lifestyle. It's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's, I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. We need to confess, a public confession, that yes, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then you need to be immersed in the water grip of baptism. No magic in the water, but your obedience, when you come up out of that water, your sins will be washed away because you will be cleansed. Maurice talked about this morning, our connection to the blood of Christ. That's our connection. And your, your sins will be washed away, and God, not me or you or anybody else, God will add you to his church. And then you will be on the path to heaven. If you haven't done that, we can help you with that this morning. If, on the other hand, you are a Christian, you've been baptized, you've obeyed the gospel, but you have fallen away, you've gone back into the world, the world, one of those lies of Satan, don't worry about it. You can't fall from grace. You can't lose your salvation once you get it. That's a lie. It's not what the Bible teaches. We do know that we can fall from grace. So if that describes you, if you've gone back into the world, you need to come home. The good news is God has given you a way to come home because he wants you to come home. He's pleading with you to come home. You can confess those sins, repent of them, pray to God forgiveness, and he's promised he'll forgive you. He'll cleanse those sins from you. And once again, you will be a child of his in good standing. So if you have a need this morning, to become a Christian, or if you have a need to be restored, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the loving call away, Come for me, love. Come for he bled for you and I. He's the same loving Savior yet. Jesus the crucified. Casting your heavy burden down. Come to the cross the world may frown. Yet you shall wear a glorious crown. When he makes up his own. Only a step, only a step. Come for he bled for you and I. He's the same loving Savior yet. Jesus the crucified. Open for you the pearly gate. Loved ones for you, now watch and wait. Terrible thought to cry to late. Jesus, I come to thee. Only a step, only a step. Come for he bled for you and I. He's the same loving Savior yet. Jesus the crucified. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock. We always need to thank Brother Mark. He always does a good, good lesson. We always take heed to the Lord. We always need to take heed to the Lord. Because he never lets us down. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark. Please remember, all on the sick list, all that are yeah. having hardships in their life and complications, pray for them.
keep them in your prior remember services. Now, at 6 o'clock, but you can invite them to come back. It's a good point. We have services Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Again, next Sunday morning, Bible study at 9 30, regular services at 10 30. <clears throat> Please turn your song book to number 500. Let's find the first verse of this. We'll have a closing prayer. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will join and comfort give you. Take it, then where you go, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy. Thank you. 